to the third episode of The Creative Real Estate Agent. Um, I am your host, Anastasia Forrest, a broker associate with EXP Realty and a very creative person. <laughs> and today I have a, a guest that I'm very excited to introduce you to, Matt Johnson is here in the studio. Oh, not the studio, but his studio. <laughs> well, respective studios, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'll am i just say a, a few things about Matt in case you don't know who Matt Johnson is, and then I'll let him tell more about himself. Um, but Matt Johnson is, first of all, the co-host of a popular real estate podcast called Real Estate Uncensored, which I've been listening to now for about two and a half years. And um, it actually, listening to this podcast inspired me to join EXP Realty, the brokerage I'm with now. And it's hilarious. If you haven't heard it, you need to listen to it for real. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, in addition to that, Matt also is the host of the Microfamous podcast. Um, and he's considered a thought leader in the real estate and neat niche marketing space. I meant to ask you, is it niche or niche? <laughs> I say niche, so uh, I keep it. I keep it simple. Okay, and the niche marketing space, and um, he's also a musician. So, welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks so much for having me. We're gonna have a blast of a conversation. Ah, I'm so happy. I'm so excited. This is very cool. So, first of all, I want to know what. How would you describe what you do as a prof for your profession? Okay. For the profession, I run a podcast production agency. So I was in real estate before that led through many circuitous routes into launching podcasts for folks, a lot of people in real estate. So uh, I've launched podcasts for people like Greg Harrelson and Lars Hedenberg and Michael Hellickson, the Club Wealth and you know, a bunch of others. Um, the reason I got into that and it just it, it kind of like all combined different past interests and my experience as a, a kind of a real estate team founder back in 06 and 07 and uh, led me back to starting Real Estate Uncensored and then that led me into podcast production. What I do on a day-to-day -day basis now is uh, most of my time is my own to decide what to do with. I run my, my marketing agency in about four hours a week. I don't schedule any calls in the afternoon. Um, I live about four blocks from the beach in San Diego and, uh, and try to do my best to enjoy life as much as I can here out in lockdown, California, but that's another story. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I essentially spend most of my days somehow in the world of podcasting, recording, uh, working with clients, uh, marketing and, uh, and having really good, deep, interesting conversations with smart people. Wow. Sounds like a good life. It's not bad. Um, all right. Well, to go in the other direction and we'll come back and connect the two, but mm -hmm. I do see a bass behind you. So I'm going to assume that one of your instruments is, well, maybe it's a guitar. That has a lot of strings to be a bass. That's it a is a seven string bass. Okay. I, I'm in love with this instrument. Yes. I, I'm, I, I don't claim to be very good at it, but I, I am in love with this instrument. Uh, over there, I've got drums, uh, piano and a guitar that I don't play very much, which sadly ha is a beautiful $1,200 custom Carvin electric that has my name engraved in the headstock. I have not touched that Ooh. guitar in a long time, sadly. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, but I went through a period where I practiced a lot. Um, but I started playing the drums when I was two, uh, banging on pots and pans in my grandparents' apartment, and they got me a pair of sticks for the first time, uh, and then got a, a drum set when I was like four. I picked up the piano in my teens, and those are really my two main instruments. So like all the experience that I have mostly in like the quote unquote, the band world, when I decided to go after that as a, as a pro was as a drummer and then ended up getting signed to management as like a part of an acoustic duo where I played piano and a girl sang. So that's kind of my, my deal. Sweet. That's yeah. great. That's fairly cool. Um, well, you're not actively practicing real estate right now, but you did mention it earlier and we know that's part of your, your story. Mm -hmm. Um, from what I understand, real estate has played an important role in leading to you doing what you're doing. Yeah, um, huge. What? That's awesome. Well, I'm curious to know what got you interested in real estate in the first place. Well, so a couple things. Number one is like it, for anybody that's watching, it's important to know I still like through the back end of real estate uncensored. I co-own a, a quote unquote like an EXP team, for example. So we have oh I don't know what is like 150 agents. Um, 
in our kind of downline team, including a whole bunch in Australia. You know, we brought Glenn Twiddle into EXP. Glenn Twiddle is one of the top real estate coaches in Australia. He's brought in a bunch of people there. So I still have one foot like pretty firmly planted in uh, into real estate. I've coached agents a little bit. Uh, I've hosted, you know, real estate uncensored since 2015. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not active like a, as an agent, but I am active in the real estate business. Now, uh, the, the reason that real estate impacted me so heavily is that when I was in my mid twenties and I was kind of debating whether I wanted to be a real estate investor, did I want to be an agent? What was I going to do? Um, and by the way, I'm like the least likely entrepreneur ever. I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't talk about this on the show very much, but I was a homeschooled pastor's kid who thought I was going to go into the ministry or maybe be a, a pro musician. Like that was, that was my mentality. I'd had, I had no sights on, on getting into business, but in my mid twenties, I read the millionaire real estate agent by Gary Keller. And that book changed my life. Right. When I realized that you could build a service business and then extract yourself from the day-to-day -day operations and be the CEO of the business that changed everything. So when I got into real estate, I didn't get in as an agent. I got in starting a team right off the bat. I brought my, my buddy into the business. I took listings. He took buyers. Um, we started like we brought on a transaction coordinator almost right away. Like I like that book changed everything about how I approached even just getting into business for the first time. Um, and that was hugely impactful. So even after I shut down my real estate team after the crash and decided, hey, like being an agent isn't my favorite thing, but I loved the marketing and the team building part of that whole that the, the real estate space. That's how I ended up getting back into the marketing game after I after my little side do detour into music. I got a job at an agency that serves real estate agents and did like their video and email marketing. So I got to work with some of the top agents all around the country on their marketing. And it was because of that background. And then when I went and I started my own marketing agency and I'm working with all these real estate people, one of my first clients was Jeff Cohn, who had done exactly what Gary Keller talked about. He had built this seven figure real estate team where he ran it in a couple of hours a week because he, he extracted himself from the daily operations. And so I had like models like that in my life. And so that's what I did in my agency world is I pulled myself out one task at a time out of the day to day operations of what my marketing agency does to the point where I'm the CEO and I babysit the operations, but I don't do any of the actual day to day work, except for when we bring on a brand new client, and I do the strategy work with the new client. So yeah, like real estate, even though I'm not selling homes every day, real estate has shaped how I look at the world and what's possible in business. Wow, wow, that's, that's a lot to unpack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it gave you a whole new way of thinking about what you could build. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I don't think I would have ever gone into, cause I'm not a natural salesperson. And if anybody is out there and can relate, like I'm, I'm, I was, I was more introverted before I'm, I'm more of like a extroverted introvert now. Like I can turn it on when I need to. So like if, if, if I need to meet with a client, I can fool them into believing I'm an extrovert for about an hour and then I need to go take a nap. So, um, so I'm not like a natural salesperson. I'm not the person who wants to wake up every day of my life going, I'm going to hunt today. Yeah. That is not me at all. So I wouldn't probably no, wouldn't have gone into real estate with the intention to be that person. And if I would have had that mentality, it would have burnt me out really, really quick. Mm -hmm. And so I had to go into it with the intention of building a team and getting myself out of those, like out of the sales role as quickly as possible. That's the only reason I even got into real estate was with that intention. Interesting. And so when I, when I went out on my own as an agency owner, like a freelancer, I was kind of a partner in a couple of, you know, coaching consulting businesses in real estate. I was a partner in a business that was like building the Netflix of real estate, which is such a cliche by now. Um, you know, I was kind of doing all these things, but it was all with the intention to get myself out of the sales role and into marketing and team building as quickly as possible. Cause I knew that's where my strengths were. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think there's a, there's, unfortunately there's a lot of people in real estate and I noticed this even years ago, we offered a course for a short while, um, on like a success guide for introverts. And, uh, cause there's a lot of people that get into real estate because of all the good things that I talked about, you know, and there's so much opportunity and you can really build a business kind of structure around your personality and all that stuff. But once you get into it, if you're on the introverted side, or even if you're just not a natural salesperson, uh, and you try to be that it can get really hard, really fast. And you think that you're the problem. And the, the cool thing about real estate that I think that people really need to understand is that you can build any kind of business that you want. 
Hmm. There's so much opportunity in real estate. You can really structure the business around whoever you are, whatever your personality is, whether you're an introvert, extrovert, does not matter. Real estate has so much opportunity and you can, you can hire out so many different parts of the business that you can build something really custom tailored to you as long as you understand that it's possible and you find a model to follow. And there's all kinds of good ones out there. Oh, that's awesome. Well, you've made me want to read the book, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. I actually you haven't, haven't read, read it yet. I what? need to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it sounds gotta, like I need gotta to. Read that. <laughs> gotta read it. Okay. No, that's cool. And it's I'm I'm glad to hear that the uh, the, the agent attraction is going well. I can never get Greg, Greg to give me a number of how many <laughs> agents he has. So now I know <laughs> the yeah. secrets out. No, yep. that's awesome. You guys have been so inspirational to me. Um, uh, just as a side note, because uh, I just. I felt like all, you guys were giving away all this free, valuable information that was so helpful. Every time I listened to the show, I learned so many things that I could immediately go and apply to my business. And I was like, I'm not getting this from anywhere else. I'm not getting this yeah. from, you know, and, and I was with other brokerages and I'm like, I'm not getting this anywhere else. And they're offering it and they're telling me about eXp. So mm -hmm. that's actually, yeah, it's been great. So yeah, that um, was always part of the mission of the show. Yeah. When Greg and I first started it, it was uh, the reason we called. Well, there was two reasons we called it Real Estate Uncensored. Number one, Greg has a mouth uh, and he does not have a filter. Uh, but the, the second reason was to really pull back the curtain of what it's really like. The, the original tagline of the show is like what it really takes to succeed. And so the goal kind of was to really pull back the curtain and talk about mm. the actual tactical stuff that you you kind of had to. In the old days, you had to pay for a coach. Like when I got into real estate, um, the broker's training was predictably terrible, which we all know. So I went and I, I had to buy a marketing course, you know, from another coach out there just to get my, my feet underneath me. And that was, you know, because it was before really podcasts existed. And so when we started the show, that was the goal was to essentially give everything away. Now, there's, there's reasons that you don't want to do that in certain cases. But in this case, um, where the goal was just to, to, you know, either get people into coaching or, I mean, realistically, we just kind of want to do the podcast for fun. We don't have, didn't have a great business model behind it uh, to start with, to be per perfectly honest. Uh, but yeah, the, but the goal was just to give everything away. And so, yeah, they're like, there's, there's still episodes on YouTube that you can go back and find from 2015 and 2016. They're so unbelievably packed that we could have charged for them as like training courses or webinars because mm -hmm. Greg was just a, we there, he's a freaking fire hose of <laughs> tactical stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's uh, that was always part of the mission of the show. So I'm glad it was helpful. Um, I don't know if I would do it the same way today, but it worked, you know, and uh, uh, just that combination of giving away at that level. I mean, it definitely worked to, uh, to build an audience. Yeah. Um, well, let's see if we can connect the music because between yeah. viral, viral marketing was your marketing agency that you, the, well, yeah, the one that, that I used to work for before. Yep. And yep. then at, at some point, I know I've heard you talk about a period of time. I believe it was during the housing market crash that you went, you quit real estate related activities mm -hmm. and you went back to music. I did. So can you tell us about that? Okay. So this is 07. The market was softening. All of our, all of my listing clients were like former expired listings and none of them had to sell. So they're watching like neighbors around them sell for $10,000 less. And they're going, I'm not doing that. So they started pulling their homes off the market. So I'm like, all right, well, I don't like the, all the client aspect, all the touchy feely feeling stuff of dealing with clients anyway. So I'm like, all right, well, I'll let, let I got to figure out what to do. So I pulled back from that and uh, got like a very part-time job just to kind of get by and uh, found myself with all this time. And I'm like, well, let's, let's get into practicing the drums again. I hadn't practiced seriously since I was uh, like in my early 20s. And so I started practicing four, five, six hours a day. I'm like, man, I'm really enjoying this. Maybe I should go join a band. And so I found a band back in Omaha where I used to live, where they they were big at one time. They got signed in the, in the 90s, kind of in the grunge movement. They were still playing. The, the music was amazing and all this stuff. So I joined my first real, real rock band. Um, and, uh, and that kind of gave me the confidence because I had no idea how, like where I kind of fit into the landscape. I, I knew I, I really enjoyed practicing. And uh, at one point, one of the guys turned around to me, like I guess that they'd, they'd heard me play piano just kind of dinking around because they rehearsed at my house one time. And he just turned around. He's like, why are you playing in this band? Like, go, go do something where you have a shot at making it. It's like, we're, we're old. Like, we're like, yeah, the music is great, but we're not going anywhere. We're not going to tour. We all got kids. And uh, so I was like, man, like, I might actually be able to, to really chase this thing. So I did. 
um, I, I ended up being in four different bands at once, uh, just trying to put as many lottery tickets into the game. I was playing drums all over town um, and kind of got my legs underneath me and kind of figured out, okay, uh, I am one of the best drummers in town, you know, according to other people. So maybe I need to like really go for this. I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a side man or not. I, the thing that ended up having the most success for me was an acoustic duo where I played piano and the girl that I was dating at the time was a songwriter singer, kind of like a Joss Stone type. She was singing. So that act got signed to management, pitched to labels, all this stuff, put out an album. But then we broke up and which that kind of means then the music then breaks up along with it. So I put that aside. I'm like, okay, well now I can, I, I've played piano. I've been signed you know, as a piano player and a songwriter. So maybe I should just go do that. So I started going down the road of being like a solo artist. I put out a solo album, not very well received. I liked it. Nobody else did. So I'm like, okay. Um, but over time of like building that, like just looking down the road of what it takes to build an income as a musician, I started to like get some marketing chops. So I learned how to build WordPress sites and I learned a little bit about social media marketing and just like kind of the general principles of marketing with the original intention was to promote my music. But I kept looking down that road and I'm looking at what it took to be a well-paid independent musician and going, I got to be the marketer. I got to be the business owner, the sole negotiator. I got to be my own booking agent and I got to tour a lot, right? To build it, to build an audience. Now this is before, you know, I was looking at it in 2010, 2011. I didn't really understand how well you could do on YouTube. Like there weren't, you know, this is before a lot of like the, you know, Justin Bieber got, get signed off of his YouTube success. Right. So I'm looking at it going, Hmm. I don't like, I just like, I, I can't be that guy that can tour all the time to build a fan base. And I built this set of marketing skills and now what do I do with them? I'm like, well, honestly, the, I, it'd be a lot better to go into the business world using the marketing skills I've built up that are way more lucrative in the business world and do music part-time. Mm -hmm. So that's what led me to even be open to getting a job at an agency. And so that's when I stumbled across, I, I responded to one single ad it was from the CEO of Viral Marketing, Frank, who's now one of my mentors and best friends. We talked that night. We spent an hour and a half on the phone. He asked me about all the books I was reading. The next day, I went in for an interview, and then that's what set me on the journey that, I, that I'm on today, where I made the decision that marketing is now my profession, and music is the passion for the side. So now I'm able to work on music, and I was just in the studio in December recording a, you know, a cover song that I was really excited about. The, the video will be coming out hopefully in the next couple of weeks and stuff. And now I'm able to just do the music that I want to do for me, and it doesn't have to build a huge audience. I don't have to tour. I don't have to play gigs all over the town and schlep my drum set around everywhere in the, in the 100 degree heat like I used to. <laughs> yeah. Like all of that stuff, like all the stuff that I hated about music, I can cut out, and I can just do the stuff that I want to do, which is mostly recording. Because I like live gigs and stuff, but I don't want to play out all the time. That's exhausting. Now I can basically do just the bits of music that I choose because I enjoy it and cut out all the rest of the stuff because I don't need the income. So that's made a huge difference like in my quality of life. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> I can relate to you about lugging around gear in the heat. <laughs> You're in it's, Florida. it's not fun. Wearing, yeah. Guitar, no. you know, guitar cases are very heavy in and of themselves. <laughs> and then are. there's your, there's your, you know, speakers and your PA and your mics and your chords and all that mm -hmm. wow well <laughs> that's very very what a what a cool story what a cool what a neat path that you have you've had so far um mm -hmm. so nowadays you've you're working on your um your marketing machine you know helping people plug mm -hmm. into that and tr uh, either setting them up on a system where you're able to help them promote or you promote their po podcasts and yeah. produce them. Yeah, we that. launch and produce them. Yep. So, do you schedule time in your day for creative stuff? It's a great question. So, on that wall right there, I have a set of post it notes. Um, and I, I fell in love with like black post it notes with white gel ink. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I have a set of post it notes where I track uh, fitness, um, cheat meals that I'm allowed, and music time. So my only goal is I have a few post-it notes up there. Basically, it's like I have 15-minute increments and hour-long increments, and I just kind of move a post. Every time I do like a music session, if it's just me tinkering around, I'll move that post-it note of 15 minutes into the I did this this week column. If I do like a full hour-long session you know, of recording and you know maybe recording some video, whatever, I move that hour over. So I can like every time I walk by that wall, 
my only goal is I want to, I just, I, it's, it's always on my mind of like how much time did I put into music this week? So I can look back at the week and go, Oh, I spent three hours on music this week or four hours or I, I, you know, I played every day or whatever. That's really my only goal. Um, like I've built the business to the point where I don't do calls in the afternoon. Every, in fact, every, any work afternoon is optional. And, um, you know, partly because I've got a recurring revenue model, I don't need, I'm not on the sales hamster wheel. I'm not on social media all the time. Uh, you know, like I have like my, my marketing system works for me to the point where I don't have to spend all my time doing all that stuff. And so I've created the space, uh, to where I can, I have the time to dedicate. And then beyond that, it's optional, like when and how I kind of distribute that time that I spend on music throughout the week. So mm -hmm. that, that's a system that works for me. It wouldn't work, doesn't work for everybody. And it's, if you want to build, if you want to build like a music career on top of a business, like you've got to be a little bit more dedicated than that, uh, in terms of putting time into it every day, whatever that is for you. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what works for me. My only goal is to just keep it front of mind and to always be doing something, a, a little bit of something every day to get over that hump of like the creative, I don't know. Um, like music has always been, it's, it's both fun and a struggle for me. And the initial thing that I feel is the struggle, which is the, uh, like I really should play something today. It's like, all right, well let's, let's just play and, and fiddle around on piano for a little bit. And then the next thing you know, it'll be an hour. I'm like, okay. So that's kind of why I set that goal of just, just do something for 15 minutes. Cause half the time, not all the time, but half the time, if I can just do something for 15 minutes, then I'll get over that hump. I'll get over the initial struggle and then I'll get into the flow. And I'll look up and it's been an hour, an hour and a half. So for anyone that can relate, like songwriting has never come easy to me. Practice, uh, practice on the drums comes easy. I can do that for four hours, no problem. But just like recording music, working on a, a cover, working on a new arrangement, um, exploring sounds, you know, learning Ableton, like all that stuff, th those are not, those do not come easy. Everything is a struggle. And so I really have to like discipline myself to just get started and then half the time, it'll all end up getting into the flow. Hmm. Oh man. Uh, your, <laughs> your, uh, your organizational schedule system reminds me of a real life 3d, uh, Trello, you know, what Trello is, I run my entire agency off okay. of Trello and you're a hundred percent right. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, I'd like to see a picture of that. And I, I try to picture it in my mind. I'm, I'm just picturing Trello just dragging. Yeah. Them. It's, it's basically like that. It's like black and white Trello in real life. Um, I also, you being a drummer actually doesn't really surprise me that much. Cause I don't know, there's something about rhythm that's so regimented and, uh, methodical. And so you're like, yeah, I can do that all day long, but that's kind of, that's really on the kind of in that left brain side, like side of the brain, I guess that's. Yeah. Like I can play, like I can practice drums while watching TV cause it's all tapping and my, like my parents, <laughs> you still, still joke around about how I drove them nuts. Cause it's just the. <laughs> it's just that um, piano, piano or something like that where it's melodic. Yeah, it like takes up your entire brain. Like you can't be watching TV while you practice piano. Like it takes your entire brain. So it is, it is different. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why I have to like get myself over the hump and, and, and push through the initial struggle. Because I think what, what's like you, you have to as like as an entrepreneur kind of figure out how much of your best mental effort you have in a day, right? And if you're like me, like, and I've had like issues like chronic fatigue and adrenal fatigue for 20 years. So I don't have a ton, right? Um, like I figure I've got like in like my, the morning is my best time. I can do four straight hours of really good mental work, but then I've got to completely disconnect for several hours, eat lunch, work out, take a walk, like completely get away from that. And then if that goes well, I've got maybe another hour or two of, of have pretty good, decent creative time where I can put towards something like music. If you, if you follow the Gary V model, you're going to burn yourself out. Like if you own, like if you have a, you know, three to four hours a day of good mentally productive time in your business, freaking maximize it. And then don't schedule another four hours of calls after that, like unplug and get away from it. Um, even Greg Harrelson, who runs, you know, an amazing real estate team on the East coast and, you know, does I don't know, something like 8 million in GCI a year or something in, insane with his team. One of the, he said, one of the best things he ever did was start playing tennis in the afternoon, get out of the office completely 
he had to, you know, you know, break a sweat and then he would literally go shower, put a suit on and then go back to the office for another couple of hours in the afternoon. And he said, initially it felt like he was taking time away from his business and you deal with the guilt of all that, right? We were talking about that before we, we went live and, but he said it was the best thing he ever did for his business, not for his personal life. I mean, that it all had all kinds of great benefits to the personal life. He said it was the best thing he ever did for his business. And that blew my mind. He told me that story like four years ago, something like that. Um, so that, that always stuck with me. And so I kind of took that, that same kind of model. So now anything like music, anything I do in the business that's in the late afternoon, it's op it has to be optional because I know I've only got probably four hours of my best mental and emotional time. And I put that towards the business to keep the business growing and flourishing. And then every, anything after that is optional. So if you are, you know, if you're listening to this, just re remember, you don't have eight to 12 hours a day of your best work to give. You just don't. You've got to unplug. You've got to recharge. You've got to replenish and refuel. And the decisions that you make when you come back later that day or the next morning are going to be better. The work that you do is going to be better. The conversations you have are going to be better. You know, so don't don't push yourself to work straight through Gary V style unless you have his energy level. But if you don't, if you're like me and you're maybe an introvert and if you've got health issues or any other constraints like you're married with kids, you know, kids suck up an extraordinary amount of mental and emotional energy. You do not have eight to 12 hours a day of your best work to give if you have kids. It's just not that's not the reality. So I think people get in, get themselves in a lot of trouble when they when they mentally put that requirement on themselves that, oh, I've got to go, go, go for eight to 12 hours a day. Like you really don't. Like the business does not demand that. You might demand that of yourself. The business actually doesn't need that. The business only needs about four hours a day of your best work and then go take a nap. That's, That's my message. Go take a nap. I love it. That's great advice. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, it takes a, it takes a discipline to set limits and you, you have to yes. set limits even on your, your work. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah, oh, if you're if you're a better person, if you're if you're recharged, uh, and I, I think that's one of the things that I, you know when we're talking about you doing a series like this, I, I think one one of the things that I would love to for people to get out of just hearing stories like this, not just mine, but just like the whole series that you're doing, is that it can coexist, but like you you have to like the things that you do in the creative end are what makes you better at your business because you bring more of yourself and you replenish and recharge that allows you to be better in your business. So yes, you want to set boundaries and all that stuff. And there's a lot of other benefits, but yeah, you really do have to like carve that time out to get that creative stuff out of you. Because if you just let that, like if you have a creative urge on the inside of you and you ignore it while you're building your business, it's going to come out sometime. It's going like it's going to struggle and break out of your chest like in the alien movie. It's going to pop out somehow um, and you may not like it. Like if you don't cr have an outlet for the creativity while you're building your business, it's going to pop out in some weird way and you're going to like rebel against your business. Right. So you have to have that outlet while you're building your business so that you're like that your whole integrated self. And when you bring that whole integrated self into your business, that's when your business will actually do better. That's very interesting. Um, you know, kind of, I feel like there's a little bit of a mirror, a reflection to the other way. Like for me, um, my creative time is more productive now that I am business minded because I don't know, it's almost like taking a break from anything and coming back to it. You come mm -hmm. back to it with fresh eyes and mm -hmm. an openness that there's room to be filled, you know, fill it up. So even with mm -hmm. the business, you come back to it, you have a new, a renewed, like, perspective, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And I know for me, like just, just not having the pressure where music is my income made a big difference and being oh, able to yeah. pick and choose the parts of music that I enjoyed for its own sake and not because I needed to build a career out of it that paid the bills. Yeah. That makes a huge difference in my quality of life. Oh yeah, absolutely. And then it's, you have room for the joy, you know, just to, to have fun with it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, there's so much I could talk to you about, but I want to, there's a couple things I want to make sure to touch on today. Mm -hmm. Um, and this kind of relates to being conscious of where you're putting your attention and spending your time. One of the things I hear you talking about a lot on the micro famous podcast is, um, suggesting that instead of trying to be everywhere at once on every social media platform, like mm -hmm. we see a lot of people doing and a lot of yeah. real estate agents doing, and there's a pressure yeah. to do that. Um, you really, um, 
re-emphasize again and again the idea that um, it's better to be strategic and select one um, and and shoot maybe choose a place that it has space for evergreen content. Yeah. Also, so I mean, I'm just I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. And I do see you more active on LinkedIn. I'm curious about why you maybe focus your attention there and obviously on the podcasting side. Well, there's a, a lot of pressure. And I would say if you're an extrovert with boundless energy, hey, do your thing. Be everywhere. You know, if, if you're Gary Vee and if you are if you have the, like a same personality and temperament and energy level as Gary Vee, go, go do it because it works for them. Uh, if you are not Gary Vee and you don't have that energy level, it will not work for you. And what you end up doing is you, you spread yourself thin, basically, and you burn out and then you pull back from everything. Right. And you go through these cycles of being on the hamster wheel and then getting burned out and stepping off the hamster wheel. The problem with social media today is that it is a pure hamster wheel. What they want is they want real time content creation and real time engagement with the audience. That is a perpetual motion machine. Why? Because they want to sell advertising and they want to maximize the number of hours that we spend on our devices. And they're not talking about just the people that are consuming the content. They want us, the content creators, sitting on our devices, on our phone, creating content, engaging with the content, uh, with our audience in real time for two to three hours a day. That's what they want. So that's also what they're rewarding. So if you're willing to do that because you have the energy to do it, great. It will work for you. But at least half of the audience that I run into in real estate have no business chasing that strategy. It will not work for you. It is a hamster wheel that you will inevitably burn out on. And as soon as you step off that hamster wheel, it stops working. And I, it always, you know, I've always marveled at this, but I especially marvel at it in real estate, you know, with the, the cold calls and stuff like that. People get pressured into doing things to grow their business that they hate doing. And that is no way to live. And it's your business won't grow very well. And if it does, you'll, you're going to burn out fast and you'll hate your own business. If you base your entire business around doing things that you hate, it's not going to go well for you. And I know a lot of people that are on all these platforms, not because they want to be and they enjoy it, but because someone else told them that's what they have to do in order to be successful in real estate. So I'm here to say you absolutely do not have to, and I'll give you an example. So years ago, I booked Lance Loken on a podcast. If you don't know who Lance Loken is, go look him up. He's one of the top guys. I think at KW, he may have gone independent by now, but at the one point in the world, he was like number two or three at KW in the entire world. They sell like 2,000 homes a year out of Houston. And I asked him one time, I'm like, what's your big focus for the year? He said, oh, man. He's like, we're really zeroing in. You know, we only track a couple of really key things per year. He's like, this year, we're really dialing in on the percentage of appointments kept to appointments set. We want to really raise that from like 65 to about 70, 75%. I'm like, that's your focus for all year is raising that percentage on that one metric. He's like, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, I asked him about like, where, where do your leads come from? You know, like you guys are selling 2,000 homes a year. Where are your leads coming from? He's like, we have two good sources and a third that we're tinkering with. Two to three lead sources. So if you think you need to be everywhere on social media because you got to get all the, all, all the leads, you do not. Like if you're an independent agent, you absolutely do not need 50 sources of leads. You need two, the same thing, two to three, if that. I mean, realistically, you need a couple. Uh, and so when I heard stuff like that and you start to, you, you get to know like Jeff Cohn, who runs, you know, the number one team in Nebraska, guess what? Two to three lead sources, two solid predictable ones and one that they're tinkering with. And you see it over and over again. The people that are the most successful, they go all in on a couple of lead sources and then they might be tinkering with something else for the future, but that's where all their leads come from. And they're not on social media all the time. Greg Harrelson isn't on social all the time. Jeff Cohn isn't. Lance Loken isn't. Mark Spain isn't. None of these guys that build really successful businesses are on social media all the time. They laugh at the people that are. I'm telling you, they laugh behind the scenes at all the people who are telling you to be on Clubhouse and all the people who are starting TikTok accounts and all this stuff. The guys who are selling 1,000, 2,000 homes a year, they're laughing mm -hmm. and they're not jumping on any of that stuff. So once you get around those people, and you realize the guys and gals who are running the best real estate businesses in the country are not doing any of that stuff. And you realize what they are doing. You go, okay, what you really need is you need a couple of lead sources. And if, if social media is one of those lead sources for you, great. If Facebook is really good for you, or for me, I like LinkedIn because it's really easy to have relationships and conversations with high level people. It's a lot easier for me a lot of times to strike up a conversation with somebody on LinkedIn than by sending them a Facebook message, for example. 
Um, and so that's worked really well for me. So that's where I spend my primary, that's my primary social media channel for growing my agency is to have real conversations with people on LinkedIn, not churning out content. If you go to my content page on LinkedIn, which by the way, you have to like click three times to even find on LinkedIn. It's not full of me posting a bunch of content. Why? Because I'm using LinkedIn to have actual conversations with human beings that might refer me business. I'm not churning out a bunch of content, mm -hmm. right? So there's whole different ways to use social media that don't involve you waking up every single morning going, what do I post on Instagram today? Like I, I said it in the book, somebody pointed out to me the other day that uh, there's, a, there's a line in the book that says, if you wake up every day asking yourself what to post on social media, you're having the wrong conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that there's uh, you can get the book and, and kind of go into detail on that. But I've always felt that have one platform. If you're going to be on social media, be in one place, build your community there, build it right, have real connection, real community, real conversations with human beings. Don't just turn out content. Don't just reproduce content from somebody somewhere else, some other platform, and just post it there and expect it to you know do a lot for you. Like be there, be engaged talk to people and you really only mostly if you especially if you're married and kids or whatever you only only have time for one of those platforms in your life you do not have time to be on five different places that's my mm. that's my belief on it interesting yeah linkedin is a is a tough one for me but it's probably because i'm going about it the same way as i'm going about the other other ones you know putting maybe putting stuff out there and not engaging enough um how many people do you aim to talk to each day on LinkedIn? Like, do you have a certain number of contacts? Yeah. So I want to do, uh, I'm having conversations. I don't track the number of conversations. My goal is to send out two to three intro teasers a day. In other words, messages that actually put like a proposition, like an actual strategic introduction. So I've got a biz dev guy who's reaching out to people. I'm reaching out to people. I'm, you know, we're, we're using automated ways to kind of get conversations started on LinkedIn. We're doing a lot of different stuff. But at the end of the day, I want to send out two to three messages, either through email or LinkedIn, where I'm actually saying, hey, John, you should meet Sally. Sally's awesome. I know you host a podcast. She hosts a podcast. Whatever the, whatever the excuse is, I'm looking for ways that I can actually make connections. That's my goal. Because uh, the more strategic introductions I make behind the scenes, good things happen. Mm -hmm. um, you can do that same thing in real estate, by the way. You know, Become that influencer, that connector in your space and start meeting high-level people. The first thing you should ask you know, when you meet somebody influential in your city is who do you want to meet? You know, what's, what's the person that if I introduced them to you would make a huge difference in your life or in your business, ask them that question and then make an effort to actually follow through and, and connect them with somebody that'll make a huge difference in your level of influence in your city. Mm, very great advice. Great advice. Yeah. So that's what I would use LinkedIn for. If you're going to use LinkedIn as an agent, use it for strategic relationship building, not for meeting the run of the mill buyer seller. Cause that's, that's like sifting through a needle in a haystack. Okay. Oh, well, very cool. That's yeah. helpful. Um, so I know we're about the point where we need to start wrapping things up. There's something I wanted to ask you that I want to make sure we touch on, um, mm -hmm. because it kind of ties the creativity and the real estate together. Mm -hmm. Um, what qualities do you think a creative needs to have to be successful in real estate? Because often, the realms of creativity and the muse are considered to be oppositional to, you know, str strategic thinking and logic, but, um, oh. but there must be some kind of, you know, what do, what do you think they need? What do you think a creative person needs to be successful in a business like real estate? Honestly, one of the things I love about real estate is the margins are so good and you can really outsource almost anything any part of the business that you don't like, you can hire somebody else to do. If you don't like the lead generation, great, buy online leads and follow up with them. Um, you know, if you don't like the client, if you like the sales part, you like closing the clients and then you don't want to deal with any of the transaction stuff, hire a transaction coordinator. Like there's so many opportunities in real estate that I personally, I don't think there is a set of qualities you need to have to be successful in real estate. That's what I've learned from, from connecting with all these different people. <clears throat> And, and actually, people like Lance Loken and, and Lars Hedenberg are really great examples. Uh, Lars Hedenberg's built a seven-figure team in the Carolinas, and then now he has a seven-figure coaching business on top of that. Lars came out of the aerospace industry and has an MBA. He's an engineer. Like, that guy is not... When you meet him in person, he's not the loud, gregarious, jiggling change in his pocket, networking with everybody, 
a vision that people have of a successful agent. He is a freaking engineer. But he, but he used that to his advantage, and then he built his team around his personality. So I think the best thing for creative people to realize is that real estate is one of the few businesses, like the few industries, where it's so wide open, and you can structure the business in so many different ways that you can find an example of out, out there of somebody that has the personality that you have, even personalities that shouldn't make it in real estate, theoretically, that have built wildly successful businesses. People that are not people people. How do you be in real estate and not be a people person? I'm telling you, Lars is not a super people person. He is an introvert, right? But he's built a seven-figure real estate team. And so I think, yeah, the, the, the message that I would say to creative people is I, I don't believe there is a certain set of, of criteria or personality characteristics because I've seen too much in real estate from people of all different types of personalities and backgrounds and build successful business around them. So I would emphasize that whatever you think is a weakness can be a strength, you know? leverage your strengths for what they are, but whatever other people are telling you is a weakness. So you're not a people person. You're not a natural sales. You're not a go getter. You're not what, what, whatever it is that other people make you feel like is a weakness. Don't let them tell you that's a weakness. Turn it into a strength. Cool. That's a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> Super, just like go into superhero mode. Turn those those uh, weaknesses yeah. into strengths. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. Just, I think we spend way too much time beating ourselves up and feeling guilty. And this is this is part of why I push back so much against the Gary Vee message, because it only works for people that are extroverted and have his energy levels. And everyone else leaves feeling burnt out and inadequate and like it's not and, and like they're the problem. And you're not the problem. So if somebody's giving you advice or or if you're looking at your heroes in real estate and you're looking up going, man, I have to change my fundamental personality in order to be successful in this business. I'm telling you, you don't. You are not the problem. Now, you may need to put a system around you that amplifies your strengths and makes up for your weaknesses, but real estate is one of those industries where it's so wide open that you can do that. You can pay for anybody else to do anything you don't want to do. You know, you can build a system around you that works with your personality, whatever it is. You can be the extreme people person who's terrible at paperwork, or you can be the engineer who loves systems and hates people. And I've seen everything in between. I've seen both of those extremes build extremely successful businesses. And I've seen every, every in between that extreme. And once you've seen that, you just realize it's not about the person. It's about the mindset. Do you want it bad enough to where you're willing to build a system around you that allows you to be yourself and still get what you want because it's possible for anyone of any personality type. Hmm. Wow. Well, that this has been so, so inspiring. And I really appreciate you, you know, taking the time to be here on my brand new podcast, you know, that's <laughs> just in its infancy. Um, but this has been wonderful and you've offered so much valuable information and perspective to to anybody that happens to hear this so thank you Thanks. so much matt really appreciate yeah. it it was i had a blast thank you so much for having me yeah my pleasure and anybody else uh, out there that might be interested in like pursuing a career in real estate or interested in exp realty um, i'm always happy to chat about my experience and how it's working well for me so feel free to reach out to me about that and until next time stay creative